a podcast about amazing people from an incredible state. Amazing Arizonans with Mike Broomhead. This is absolutely the reason why we do Amazing Arizonans is people like the story you're about to hear. Truly one of my favorite people in Arizona, Jan Diotri. Oh, uh, really, I love I, you, Honestly. Mike. I miss you. 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. How hard to believe it's been 20 years. I, know. I met you <laughs> when I first started jumping into the political world, but you were in the media then. Mm-hmm. And we met through friends and and 20 years. I know. Loved you instantly. Instantly, Mike. No, it's not hilarious. It's true. <laughs> I had a big crush on you. Oh, you did, did you not, not know that? I did not Why, know that. Are you? He's blushing. I am. Look at <laughs> because there's a story. Look at your face. I know. This there is. is great. There is a st- first. Let's let's set the table. Oh, okay. Though. You are a happily married woman. Let's let's be honest. Okay. <laughs> it's not like I had a shot. <laughs> um, um, oh but my God. I no, was I'm blushing. Okay. In 2004, I don't know if you remember this or not. Okay. 2004. 2004. Wait, is this going to be embarrassing? I hope so. Oh, um, God. <laughs> 2004, I was asked to be the master of ceremonies for John McCain's final rally. Oh, gosh. Before, this was 2008, I'm yes, sorry. Yes, yes. <clears throat> 2008. I remember that. Before the final rally before the presidency, right. the, the election night. Right, I remember You and that. I were set to host a party together at the Biltmore on election <laughs> night, which got canceled because... Because we got go, drunk. It, yes, right. <laughs> it, and it didn't go the right way for our oh, team. God. Oh, my God. Did, was I crying in yes, the aisle remember? and you picked me yes. up and hugged me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I remember that. But we were at the rally in Prescott. Yeah. And there was a VIP room. Yeah. Do you remember this? Yes, I do. So we were in the VIP room and now I was married at the time. It's now my ex-wife. And remember the reporter at the time on Fox? He was lanky and goofy, and but he was the reporter. Yeah. I can't remember who was with you. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. So I walk into the room with my wife, <laughs> and from across the room, you shout, Uh-oh. I love this man. <laughs> and it wasn't McCain. Uh-uh. It was me. <laughs> it was Mike and you Roman. came over and gave me a big <gasps> hug. Is that why you got divorced? No. <laughs> but she did not have the sense of humor you and I have. Oh, Mike, you never it was told hilarious. me. It you was never hilar- told me that story. It was hilarious because I thought it was hilarious at the time. <laughs> That's why I'm divorced. Not oh. that reason, but that I have a sense of humor. Oh, how she do I feel right humor. now? <laughs> well, here's this, here's this beautiful woman Aww. running across the room saying she loves me. I love you, Mike. And my wife had no idea who you were. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Why? It was hilarious. Are you happy now? Yes. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. You know what? The <laughs> heck with 20 years ago. <laughs> so let's, let's, <laughs> let's start at the beginning. Let's start with your time, because you were in the media and a, and a superstar. Aww. I know you're not going to say it, but you no. were a superstar, a big name in the Valley media. And you walked away from it. I did. And so I was on the air 46 years here in Arizona. At the time, the longest female still on the air consistently. And you know what, Mike? I worried about walking away because it's, as you know, it's a heady business. It's every day is different. You're meeting the best of the best and the worst of the worst. And you're trying to make a story. And... Hold that aside for a second. My mom and dad had a very famous restaurant in Lake Tahoe in the 1950s and 60s. And my mom did the rap parties for all the entertainers that would appear at the casinos. Nat King Cole, Jimmy Durante, Marilyn Monroe, Clark Gable, Elvis Presley. They were all our regulars. So I grew up in the food business. I grew up uh, in the back of a kitchen, and then I had a couple restaurants of my own. But at the same time, I had the parallel television, radio, and newspaper career, and then launched some videos online. And I was worried um, about leaving the media because I thought, my gosh, how, who's going to replace the adrenaline? Who's going to replace the, all of that? I struggled with it. An incident happened at the station where I have really figured out that it wasn't my place anymore. It, there was no place for somebody like me. And I got up the next morning and I said, I'm done. And my husband said, you've been pouring over this for three years. You're done? I went, I woke up, I'm done. I'm done. And then the miracle happened. I was going to retire because, you know, I love to fly fish. So I wanted to spend the rest of my life fly fishing. And I did a guest chef class at Sweet Basil Culinary Center in Scottsdale, and she asked me to do another one and another one. Well, fast forward, I'm now, and then I went part-time, so now I'm full-time culinary instructor and retail. 
in the retail. So I'm full time in my retirement in my second year career. I can't. My husband calls me bipolar with just the high. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, "There, you're bipolar, but you're never low. It's just high and higher and higher." Yeah, you are, and you are high energy, and that so high energy, and so. I couldn't retire. I couldn't just do nothing. So this was the perfect fit. My heart is full of food, passion for food. Food is the great connector, as you know. People come into the class not knowing how to cook, and three hours later they walk out and say, I can do this again, I love it. My heart is completely full. Never look back. You don't give yourself enough credit, I don't think. I don't know if you like this moniker or not. I know you've heard it, but people refer to you as the Martha Stewart of Arizona because you created an industry for yourself. It was food, but it was the entire culture of everything. And you were so loved by people in that world, which is not easy when you're in the media to go from that to have such a following in in the food culture. It's incredible. Yeah, it was really neat. I was... um, I was in the station one day, and we were getting ready for the show, and all of a sudden we look up, and everybody goes, Jan, Jan, look at Al Roker. And Al Roker was featuring my recipe in the Today's Food yeah. section, and I just thought, oh my gosh, it was so exciting, you know? But um, the media just didn't hold my heart anymore, and it was time for me to walk away. Loved it. Loved What's every it like, second. What is it like sharing that passion for food with your mom. Okay, so my mom, so should we talk about her a little bit and, and who she is? I would love is? it. I would love it. So my mama <clears throat> is 96 years old, going on 14. So we went on vacation last year, the whole family, we took a river cruise. We got a little upset at mama because she had signed up for a bike tour through the Alps by herself. <laughs> and we said, no. So she decided, a couple weeks ago, she decided to uh, join a gym. And of course, as you know, you work with trainers. They push you. Sure. They care more about pushing you than about your own. So here's 96 year old. They've got her lifting weights. She wrenched her back. And then a couple days later, she wrenched it again. And we're thinking, Mama, what happened to you? She, she said, nothing. Then the neighbor came over and said, How's Mama? I saw her trimming the trees. Can't keep this woman down. But she is the I most. I wonder where you get it. She's the most culinary. She is an exquisite gourmet chef who. Her approach is delicate flavors and refined sauces. Me, I want to knock you over the skull with food. Yeah. It's like, eat bolognese and ricotta, yeah. you know, and just everything I could feed you because that means you love me, right? Mm-hmm. But mama, we have to tell the Mama smacked Mike Broomhead in the head. <laughs> it was so funny. I'm so, so glad you remember that so, story. Oh, yeah. So mama, so... Uh, Mike, I'm sure he's, you've talked about your electrical yeah. career and stuff. So Mama wanted Mike to come over and check out some electrical wiring or something. It was on a piece of a, a cooking equipment. Yeah, right. So she loves Mike. I love a Mike. So he goes over there and he's in the process. He's telling her that he loves to cook and he's thinking maybe about opening up something someday. I said I would love to own a restaurant After someday. your career here. And she smacked him across the head. What's the matter? You stupid. Yeah, don't you got, be stupid. You got, a, you got a good you got a good thing going, yeah. Mike. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't be stupid. Oh, God. For someone who has been so supremely successful in the restaurant business. She wanted me to know, don't do it. It's a tough gig. Yeah. It's a tough gig, especially now because people don't want to work like they used to. And the restaurant business is tough. People get into the restaurant business because they love food and they love wine and they love to share it. There's none of that. You are putting out fires all day long. The Roma tomatoes didn't arrive. The basil is is (laughs) skimpy. Uh, You know, the... uh, Or people don't show up. So, but let me ask you, because let me tell you why I love the restaurant business. What I love about it is you either have a very good business mind or you're very, very creative as most people. Right. You have to be both in the restaurant Uh, business. hundred percent. You have to be business minded because it's a business. You got to make money. Yes. But you have to create something that's going to bring people in that they can't do at home. Right. How do you do? I mean, you have to be a genius to do both. You have to, or you get venture capitalists or you get a business manager who has hands off is, is there to create your vision, not to interject their vision. But you have to let them run the business side of things. You do. And that's a tough call. And that's why so 95% of 
of business, restaurants fail within the first five years. Then on top of that, you have two more elements. You've got um, you know, have to have the business sense and the creative sense. But these days you've got Yelp, right? Mm-hmm. And you are, it, people never like to say good things. They always like to talk about sure. the bad things. So you're constantly responding to, you know, you had a bad dish that come out or, you know, somebody didn't show up. You have to deal with all of that and manage it. And restaurant tours usually they'll either respond, which is a 24-7 job, or they won't. Neither one of those are great for the And rent. what was the, there was a study that said human nature that if you have a good experience with something you'll tell a person yes if you have a bad experience you tell seven people. people yeah and that the study was like between seven and ten people 100 when you have a bad and that's all of us when right. you have a bad experience somewhere right that exactly. um you know and so i would imagine that's got to be a, a, a kind of a negative but you have been so supremely successful in all of these things because you have both you are a very savvy business person i think the media gave you that Mm -hmm. but you're so creative you could you reinvent yourself all these times well you know what i just turned 70 and this is my second full-time career uh the fly fishing has gone by the wayside a little bit i get to do it a couple times a year and but that's okay because i'm just having mike my heart is full how how could you not love waking up every day and knowing that you get to help somebody that day you get to help 15 people that day and their lives are going to be more joyful as a result oh my gosh where else do you find that did you ever imagine earlier in your cooking career that there would be this explosion of interest of people in the industry. It's amazing. And kids, we do, in the summer, we do kids camp and teen camp. And these kids come in and they are master chefs, iron chefs, and they come in here with their own aprons and their hats and their chef toques. And and they sometimes they bring their own knives and I'm like, no, 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 hang on a second. Let's get real here. Let's learn knife skills. Let's how, learn how to be safe. Let's be a little bit humble about, you know, you're 12 years old. You're probably not an iron chef at this point. You could be, but let's take Do it they step. love it? They love it. They love it. The problem is Instagram and TikTok and Pinterest is teaching kids that they want to be huge stars without the process. Right. And uh, 87% of all Pinterest projects fail because people who do that aren't interested in giving you the step by step, which you need in cooking. They just go from this quick video, great audio, and then all of a sudden you've got this wow rainbow cake with this these things coming out of it, and they think they can do that. They're missing the whole middle step, the business side, the safety side, you know, what they're in it for. Mm-hmm. So when um, there's a, anecdotally, there's a, a my brother and I, we were in New York for my nephew was in a basketball tournament. So I went to New York to watch my nephew play. And my brother and I were sitting around in the hotel and he said, hey, there's this guy in Phoenix that I watch on Instagram that cooks. He goes by the handle uh, three pieces of pecan. His name is Chance. He's, I love that. Okay, and he, well, it's because his father, I think it was his father, taught him to sm- on the smoker, and he always used three pieces of pecan wood in the smoker. That's awesome. where the name came from. I love that. But he is the head of, the president of, I think president is the title, of the Thunderbirds. He oh. of the puts on the golf wow. tournament. Wow. Yeah. Again, but what he's known for, 400,000 followers. Oh, my gosh. My brother follows him. And I said, well, I know him. I said, he's a friend of mine. And I sent him a text. He gets asked for autographs. People see him out in public. All the work the Thunderbirds do in charitable work. Means nothing. Everything he did in his business <laughs> career as a successful businessman. Yeah. And people want his autograph because yeah. he cooks on Instagram. Right. And the guy's a great cook. I mean, you watch his recipes. But that connection people have of want me i i love to cook i don't know anything about it but look at how many people are listening to you talk stories about yeah. ribs or beef or whatever yeah. you do you know they love it they eat it up do you laugh so let me i, I honestly okay. I, I here's the two things i posted so far and i'm doing it <laughs> once a week um i'm really working hard on a chili recipe that i can call my own that i really like okay and i've been working hard on it. i posted that got a good, great response yeah. i even they even asked me for the recipe i posted my recipe can i ask you what beef what meat you I use uh, the recipe calls for a pound and a half of meat. So I use ground meat or ground meat. I use a pound of eighty five fifteen ground beef and a half a pound of hot Italian sausage. Good. So uh, mixing that up, I use the chili beans. Mm -hmm. I use a can of crushed tomatoes, a Mm -hmm. can of diced tomatoes. Right. Um, I dice a uh, I I I cook down the onion, half an onion, with a jalapeno pepper. Wow. 
Mm-hmm. Um, that's the basics for the recipe. And then I season it chili, sh- chili powder and the other seasoning. Yeah. Let it cook for about 45 minutes. And that's, see, you don't need to cook something all day. 45 minutes. And can I give you my favorite tip sure. about anything you cook with red sauce? Mm-hmm. So if you ever come across a recipe for a bolognese, a meat sauce or a marinara sauce or any kind of a red sauce or stew or chili... If you ever see a recipe that calls for sugar, Mm -hmm. there's never should be granulated sugar in your meat sauce. And I'll tell you why people do it. Don't ever salt your stew, your chili, your meat sauce until it's all done. And then you set it off the stove and then you add salt. And the reason why is salt makes tomatoes acidic. That's why people. So bring during the in, cooking process, yes, and the more the more salt and tomatoes are married together, the tomatoes become acidic. It's the same thing with cooking something all day long. Don't do that. Get into the habit of tasting the food without the salt. Turn when it stops and you've turned the stove off. Then add the salt, Mike. You're going to realize it's got a smooth, beautiful, okay. su- natural sweetness with the onion and the t- organic tomatoes and all that. So that's because my I was I was adding to the recipes I've seen. I was adding the salt and pepper at the same time I put in the oregano and the chili powder. So I'll do it. I'll, I'll change it next time. Do it and and let me know if that makes a difference. I will. Okay. So the second thing I posted, <laughs> and I think you're going to laugh at this because for me it was quite an accomplishment. Was I did braised short ribs. Ooh, that is quite an accomplishment actually. And they actually came out. I liked the way they came out. Yeah. And then the the oil to get the oil off the top. I used a slice of bread to get the oil off the top. Hey. Um, I learned that from Gordon Ramsay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why I say that is because the connection I have, you know, talking to the audience and everything else is I love my job. Mm-hmm. But the response I get about anything food, yeah. I'm certainly no expert. I'm just saying, hey, I'm trying this. What are some of your suggestions from people? Right. People are jumping I on board it. to talk about it. It's that one thing that connects Everybody. everybody, even if you don't like this particular dish, everybody wants to talk about cooking do you and know, food. Do you know who Fran Lebowitz is? Yeah. Okay. I love Fran Lebowitz. She's just a satirical <laughs> genius. She, in her latest diaries, she said, there are two people or two categories in life. Food and music are the only two things that bring memories back Mm -hmm. that heal your heart where you celebrate joy where you remember where you were it's the same thing with you're going to remember when you made those short ribs you're going to remember when you know Simon and Garfunkel did the song on your first date music and food change people's lives they change people's lives and the people that deliver those two things that deliver a cooking instruction or a musical note people love because it's helped them through their life. It's funny you say that because I've said this and I did not hear her say that, but I've talked about food and music. Even when you are sad and in mourning, our family at family funerals, there are, there are certain songs that are played at every family funeral and there's always a meal after potluck we in our family we're twisted because we call it the after party but there's (laughs) always an after party (laughs) in every family but it is a time where i remember the you know that horrible time when my brother was killed and what an awful experience that was but after but when it was over there was the time where (sighs) at that point where everybody ate together that's when people started to share stories and there was an ability to laugh a little bit about some of the things and and it it really helps in the healing you're right the music the very last song we played at my brother's funeral was a Hootie and the Blowfish song because he loved Hootie and the Blowfish and so that was significant but it was afterwards when we got to meet his friends and the people that he loved outside of our family and we all got to share our stories that meal meant so much oh my god that is the perfect and that is the perfect perfect example of how food brings people together. You you sit at the kitchen table when you you broke up with your boyfriend. You sit at the kitchen table when your grandmother passes. You sit at the kitchen table when you've graduated from college. You sit at the table to live and to recall those memories. And it's amazing. And I think people, you know, we've gotten so tech in this world that I think tactile food, I don't know about you, but for me, cooking is my therapy. I will spend 95% of my life at home in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. It's my world because I love 
the kitchen is the only room in your entire house where all your senses come alive. Taste, touch, smell, scent, everything comes alive. They're all activated and alive, and it's therapeutic. It's funny. It I, it, for me, the passion for it has grown more in the last couple of years just because I've been in practice. I got over the, I'm not going to do this because I don't know what I'm doing, and I just said, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to figure it out. Right. And so uh, now I've gotten over the fact that it has to be perfect. So I love yes. it more. And so now I look around at when I'm going to buy a house, I say the next house I buy is going to have gas appliances <laughs> yeah. and it's going to have a kitchen I can cook in. Don't tell Biden that. Okay. <laughs> Do we, should we go down that road? No, <laughs> I don't want to go down that. I'm too but, happy. <laughs> but I agree with you. And and my earliest memories as a child, when I, first, I, I had my first job at 12 years old, was in a restaurant. Yeah. I got hired under the table. I remember. In a restaurant. Yeah. I worked and I lied about my age at 15. Me too. To work in a restaurant. Me too. And I remember I started out, um, I was a prep cook. Mm -hmm. And what that gave me in a mass production setting was I learned from in a Mexican restaurant the basics of in the morning, this is what you have to do. You've got to make the salsa because the salsa goes into the guacamole. That's right. You have to make the guacamole because it goes into the recipes. And you have to. And I learned that process. And then as a line cook and, and all these other things I did, there was a sense of accomplishment for me every day yeah. when I would do the lunch buffet at 16 years old. Amazing. That the restaurant would be full and they loved the rest. The, now, they weren't my recipes. Mm. I was just a cook at the mm -hmm. time. But the sense of accomplishment of these people love this. Yeah. I loved it. It's amazing, isn't it? I yeah. just, it's, you know, and then you have to counter that with knowing that, um, that you never really have a good time at anything until you get good at it. If you think about that, you know, practicing the piano or practicing the guitar or practicing cooking is not as much fun as knowing you've nailed it and you can do it again and again and again and it's going to be great. But the reason why I know I love it is I love that process, process. of getting good at it. Me too, yes. So I love tasting the third and fourth batch of chili, tasting the difference yeah. from the first one. So you've done chili and you've done short ribs. What What is it that you'd want to tackle next That it, that's iconic, like maybe Julia's buff bourguignon? Are you or, sure? Do you want to know this? Yeah, I do. I do. Because you're going to laugh at no, me. No, it's a. is it a burger? Mm -mm. No. No. I, again, grilling and smoking is something I've done, I can do pretty well because I've yeah. done it my whole life. Okay. What is it? It would be pasta. <gasps> Why don't you come and take my pasta class? I want to. So listen. You know what? I signed up for your knife skills class, but something came up and I couldn't go. <laughs> oh I was gosh, signed darn. up for the knife skills class Shoot. on a Saturday, and something came up and I couldn't attend. But I was so disappointed. Oh my God. I just wanted to surprise you and walk into that room. That would have been so amazing. So at, at Sweet Basil at our school, we do – so I do – a cheese making class. We make homemade mozzarella, homemade ricotta, homemade cheese curds, homemade mascarpone. Then we make homemade bread to go with it. We do a pasta class where you make homemade fettuccine, homemade gnocchi, homemade risotto, just hope from scratch. And you realize that pasta is flour and egg and a little oil and salt. Period. Okay, fair That's enough. How you make pasta? But there's an art to it. So when I was a kid, my, I grew up um, Polish Irish. Okay. My grandmother from Poland. When I was a little boy, she would cover the kitchen table and she would make punchkis and she would make uh, pierogies okay. and from scratch. And I remember watching her do that. It's just this and this and this. And then she'd roll it out on the table and she would make this amazing food. And nobody, we were just, we couldn't Could wait you? to eat. And so for me, I love Polish food because it's my background, but I really want to learn Real Italian. When I went to Italy for the first time to to watch how everybody has their way of making wine and how they have their own way of making their sauce and how they make their pasta and the pride right. they take in it exactly. and then sharing it with everybody. Right. Exactly. That's the feeling I want. I want that feeling. Yeah. Exactly. And you know what? You can make, like if you're making gnocchi, you can do it with a, your finger or a little fork, or you've got a gadget. If you're doing cavatelli, you can do it with your hand, or you've got a gadget. If you're making pasta, you can do it by hand, or you've got a pasta machine. And it's a beautiful thing to make that fresh pasta, put it in the boiling water with a ton of salt, making a little... Um, uh, just a little cream sauce or a little white sauce, whatever. But isn't the so preparation cool. as, as big a part as the actual meal? Absolutely. For Absolutely. me anyway. I you love that. I love to cook for my <clears throat> friends. In Italy, I was, <clears throat> the last time I was back, we have some lovely friends there. You know how they do, Mike, you got to do this. They do a pasta party. 
They have the big wheel of Reggiano Parmigiana, which is probably about $5,000. They carve it out. And for years, they put their pasta in there and then scrape the bottom. Yeah. And then you've got this beautiful uh, cheese wheel that you just wipe out and you use it for years and years and years. And every time you scrape that pasta out, you're getting a little bit of that cheese. Oh, my gosh. What's the, what is the what is the cheese wheel that they use in, 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 uh, in, in restaurants and in places? A big cheese wheel that they light on fire and then they melt the cheese. Reclet? Is that what it is? Yeah. I'm asking because... Because I've, I've seen those videos and I thought, what and, and what that is the presentation and how creative that is, but uh-huh. how delicious it looks even watching it. There is a pasta dish that you have to make. It's so cool. It's called pasta a la cena. And it is, you burn the pasta in a cast iron skillet, literally burn it. So what oh, I you, can accomplish that. <laughs> I pull that off easy. <laughs> there's a there's some great videos online, but it's called Pasta a la Cena. And what you do is you make this sauce. It's with this passata. It's called, it's kind of like just a, a thickened crushed tomato juice. And you put that in the skillet. And then you put, you lay out uh, just raw spaghetti. And then you start cooking it like you're doing risotto for a, about an hour. And then it burns on the bottom. You flip it over. The burnt part goes on the top. Then you burn the bottom. Burnt pasta doesn't sound good, but it is unbelievable. Wow. It's unbelievable. So good. I am. The reason why I'm so compelled by this is I don't have a. I can't sing. I mean, barely. I can carry a tune. If you've heard the Sanderson Ford commercial, I did better than the rest. But I'm not. I am not a singer. Wait, you sang on Sanderson? Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. We all did. Okay, sing it for me. Mm -mm. No, come on. No, I'm not. Come on. No, there's not a chance I'm singing. Sanderson Ford. That song. So we all had one line. Which so it was me. It was Rosie Romero. It was John Gambadoro. It was Tim Hattrick. <laughs> it was Priscilla from from over there on 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 Mix. And so we all had a line. And what and was, was your it, line? Um, Sanderson Ford Country. San- so how does it go? Uh-uh, I'm not just. I'm, you're not triggering me. You into are it. no fun. But, I came all the way down here to see you. And you're not going to even sing. So for me? my point <laughs> is, the creativity part of it is, I feel like. Like you said, you're not happy until you're good at it. But I feel like that's where my creativity lives, is that I can really, if I, when my friends come over, I, I've, I'm the worst at it because I don't know how to make pasta, but I love lasagna. Yeah. So when my friends come over to share, I make lasagna, but I use the store-bought noodles, and I think, I can't do this forever. Okay. I have to learn how to do this. So store-bought noodles and ho- store-bought lasagna noodles and homemade lasagna noodles is they're so far apart. Mm-hmm. The homemade lasagna noodles will literally melt in your mouth. And then if you add bechamel in between the ricotta and the meat sauce and the cheeses, even that, oh gosh, it's just, it's crack. So, it's Italian crack. It's funny because <laughs> what you say about this is so funny. Can because, I say that? Of course. Okay. I... <laughs> I'm I I'm I don't know a lot about wine. I like wine. I don't love it, but I like wine. I went to an olive oil tasting because I never realized. Awesome. Well, because you don't. I love to cook. Yeah. But I never realized you need for someone oil. like you, as technical as you are, would notice the difference immediately. For me, tasting that difference and like, oh my gosh, what a difference just that would make in it's, anything. Exactly. Those are the creative things you think an artist that someone that says, okay, they can teach you to paint. They can't teach you to be an artist. Right. And that's the difference. You can teach people to cook. You can't teach them to be a chef. Exa- you're exactly right. You know, um, I'm reading a lot about salt. I'm, I'm really going down a road about salt. And salt is the most misunderstood um, spice in the kitchen. And it's so important. If you think of the words salvation, saliva, so many words, salary. Salt was so valuable, people paid their employees in salt. It, cha- it, it started wars. It ended wars. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now we Biblical have... Biblical references. The, yes. Salt and, of the earth. That's right. Now we have all of these $18 an ounce salts that are, you know, Florida salt and gray salt and sea salt mm-hmm. and Himalayan salt and Sicilian salt. It's not about the salt. 
it's about how you use it. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of people we, we serve will teach them how to do a good New York steak, and they'll just barely salt it with a little bit of pepper. They're amazed at how much salt we actually put on that steak because— and then do you salt steak before you, you know, do you take it out of the refrigerator and salt it or do you salt it right? Salt, if you can understand salt and how to use it, your food is going to be better. And and that's, those are the technical things I would like to eventually learn. I I had, um, mm-hmm. I had the former governor, Fife Symington, mm-hmm. we had lunch and you know, he he's a, a foodie. Cu- he is culinary school. <laughs> yeah. And I told him when I retire. I'm going to culinary school. You I don't know are? where I'm going. I'm definitely oh going. Gosh, gonna Just be so because cool. I want the freedom. I want someone to teach me to paint. And then I want to see if I can be an artist. Right. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I live alone. So I'll eat it for three days. I don't care. Because yeah. I make the recipe as it's not for one person. Right. right. Um, but I love to share food. I like the experience of, uh, I just think to me that's, like you said, it's such a connector. Yeah. But the more I learn, the more I realize what an art form it is. I loved, I've watched everything Gordon Ramsay. I love the attitude. I love everything he does. Yeah. But I, the skill, I don't think Incredible. you can fake that. You know, it's not necessarily reality in reality TV necessarily, right. but he was on MasterChef and they were making, they had to make a, a dish in a skillet in 90 minutes, a one skillet dish. I love MasterChef for yeah. that very reason. Yeah. And so I was watching that and there was 60 minutes left out of the 90 and he made a comment. It was all a setup, I guess, about how I could do this in 60 minutes. I don't need 90. And they said, well, go do it. So he went down there and just created this amazing thing in 60 minutes. And by the time he wow. was done, all of these great cooks, all of, I would say chefs, but as amateurs as they were, all of the great things that they made looked amazing oh until gosh. you set it next to his. And you think, there's a master. Mm-hmm. And so that's yeah. that is you. I mean, you know oh, that's no. you. Yes. No. Is. No. No. I mean, I didn't know if I could teach. I had no idea. I I, I jumped into this situation, <clears throat> not knowing um, if I had the skill set. Uh, but it's it's been in my journey every day. I'm learning. And here's what I love about teaching: is I become a scientist in the kitchen, and I love it. And my students love that we do that. We experiment. Okay, so yesterday I said, okay, saute these mushrooms, and everybody sauteed them about the same, which is, you know, you saute them till they're soft, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. You saute those in butter for a long, long, long time until all it all evaporates. And then the brown butter, the butter becomes brown and you get this nutty flavor. That's when a mushroom is done. So we set up raw mushrooms, medium, and and they taste. And it's a science project. It's like, why? What is the mayor? You know, what is the caramelization? What does that mean? How does that work? So they're really learning Mm -hmm. why something tastes good or why something tastes bad. But I don't know that... I don't know that people are going to have the passion for it if the person teaching the class doesn't have the passion for it. Don't you? I mean, that would be absolutely. In anything. It's when, in any in school. I loved journal. I took a journalism class because of the teacher. I hated math because of another teacher. So yeah, they're very influential. You know. Yeah, and so the path for you has been so interesting to me. Watching and knowing you and all this stuff that you do to see you where you are now. You said I've got my second career at seventy years old. Full but, blown. So full blown. what's next? I mean, what is it? What is it for you that you still? Is it how many students you can teach, or is there something more you want to do? You know what, Mike? I think it's going to be like it was with television. I'm going to just say, I'm done. Um, when I'm not, when I'm not growing, and I'm not there a hundred percent and I'm not giving my full heart, then it's probably time to just, I, I have to retire at some point, right? I have to. Why? You know what I want on my gravestone? Isn't your mom 96 and not retired? Yeah, she's, that's right. Okay. <laughs> I, on my gravestone, I want these two hands with this towel just wrung out, just yeah. going, I'm done. Yeah. I'm just done. Yeah. But I'm nowhere near there, you know? What I'd love to do is uh, spend time, you know, we have 33 rescue animals and they've all suffered Mm -hmm. because I haven't had a chance to be with them. I want to spend more time with family and my husband and the animals and fish. So I've got to figure out how to do that before I'm 96. Yeah. Yeah. Before before uh, your family's telling you, no, no, no. I know, yeah. but mom could do it right now. She go, would go fly fishing with me. She would go flying with me. She would do anything with me right now. When you look at what you've accomplished, 
What are you most proud of? Oh, my gosh. I wasn't expecting that question. That's a big question. Longevity in the media, highly respected by your peers in the media. In the world you're in now, you've blazed a trail for yourself. What is it you would say? Um, oh, my gosh. I can't believe I stumped you. Uh, you really stumped me because I never think about those things. I don't, I don't know if people like me. I don't know if I'm regard. I don't know. I think I, I do know. The thing I'm most proud of is the connection that I have made with people and that they trust me. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a story about that if you have time. I absolutely. So I don't know if I should say this. Well, but, even better. <laughs> but it's people that it, if knowing that I can help people and that they they respect me for it and they like me for it. You know, I, I don't know, Mike. I don't know how to answer that because I don't live in that space in my head. Yeah. Because I, I, I think the thing I'm most proud of hasn't happened yet, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, all, you know, everything I've accomplished, the awards and the longevity, and, and that has been great. I don't know. But a lot of times, like in our world, it's that's what other people think of us. Yeah. If, if my show wasn't popular with certain, I wouldn't have a show. Yeah. But what mm -hmm. is it that when you sit back, you know, for me... My relationship with my brother, you know, yeah. my family is still so with everything that we've gone through from childhood all the way through, we've remained best friends. And so that relationship is something I'm very proud of because we live thousands of miles from each other. We only see each other a few times a year. But those are the kinds of things that it matters to me what they think. That to me is what. That's an accomplishment to me is that exactly. the people you love and what they think, yeah. because others you're going to disappoint on a regular basis. Always, yeah. If I disappoint them, I think for me, then I know I'm off track. I think that's really true. I have a picture of Jesus in my bathroom and it's being held up by my Emmy. <laughs> so I, can't, I don't see my Emmy. I just see this picture. <laughs> I guess I could get a legit frame for it, but I don't know. It just works. So, so when I leave the bathroom and I'm done with my hair and everything, I look at his picture and I just say, let me be a force for good today. Let me be available to help and let me be available to make somebody's life better. Every day, that's mm -hmm. my mantra. And at the end of the night, I go, did I do that? How did I do that? And if I'm so aware, especially in retail, you mm. know, people always have stories, a long stories that they want to talk to you about. And the phone's ringing and other people are waiting in line. But they want to talk about mm -hmm. what they want to talk about. And you have to be patient and just listen because you may be the only person that listens to them that day. Right. You know, and have that presence of mind, you know, uh, not we're not going to turn this into a sermon, I guess. But the Apostle Paul in a study of his life and how difficult it was. And he was chained in a hole in the ground and said, I've learned to be content wherever I am. Absolutely. But what he if you look back at what the Apostle Paul prayed for, he prayed to be usable. He didn't pray for it to be easy. He didn't pray for great accomplishments. He prayed to be usable. And That's I thought, exactly right. and how usable was the guy writing <laughs> so much of the New Testament, if you're a Christian, we'll talk about someone that had their prayers answered. In prison. Hard and, life, yeah, no, horrible no, life. Yeah. But just prayed to be usable. And that's exactly my, my, my prayer in the morning. Yeah. So what do you say, um, what do you say to the people that are as enthusiastic as I seem to be about learning to cook, that for whatever reason, they hesitate. What is it they need to know about jumping in and doing it? So I think what I would say, number one, <laughs> is if you eat three meals a day, three times your lifetime, Yeah, you have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of choices to get it right. So don't stress if you burnt the hamburger bun who cares who cares enjoy the process enjoy everything the chopping the smells the sound you will find a place where it becomes therapeutic and your heart will open up to it and I would say um, maybe take classes instead of watching because I do a macaron class and we just pray to the macaron gods every time they come in because they're tricky they're so finicky if it and I'm teaching one on Saturday and it's raining and you everything you read never make macarons on a rainy day because of the humidity so I would say tackle simple things you know at sweet basil we teach um, a, it's called Essence, and it's a 12-week program where you're learning everything about eggs, everything about your knife, everything about meat, everything about chicken. 
that gives you, you need a good base. <clears throat> if you're looking at TikTok and Instagram, you're going to get some stuff, but you're going to get the big wow, the visual, the, the, mm-hmm. the, you know, all of that. You're not going to get the basics. And if you screw up, who cares? Don't listen to the mom in your head when she told you you couldn't fry an egg. Yeah. Don't listen to any of that. Make it an adventure. You know what, Mike? Don't you believe that the real experiences lie always right outside of your comfort zone? Oh, absolutely. Right? And just, the, just best, push you. the best lessons I've ever learned have been in failure. 100%, unfortunately. Unfortunately. That's but true. in the hindsight, when you look back past the failure, yeah. it was the best thing that happened to you in that circumstance yeah. because it taught you a lesson. I had a private um, <clears throat> um, class last night. There were... 12 men, 85 was the youngest, and they're called the gentlemen of leisure, and they come in and they cook with us. They made popovers like nobody has ever made, and popovers are tricky, but the pride, and they, you know, their wives cook for them all their life, but this is their leisure activity. They mm-hmm. like to come and have wine and cook and, and talk, and, um, but they were so proud. You know, if you teach kids to cook, they're learning science. Talk about um, STEM. They're learning science. They're learning technology. They're learning chemi- math. math, chemistry. They're learning flavors. They're, they're learning so much in that one kitchen, you know? When I was in Italy, we took a bunch of listeners to Italy, two busloads of people. It was, it was such a great trip. And on the final day that I was there, it was they were there for 11. I was only there for nine, eight or nine. Um, I was in with one group in Florence, which I absolutely yeah. fell in love with that city. Yeah. The other group was in Tuscany at a farm mm-hmm. where they were getting a cooking lesson. <laughs> and then they were cooking the meal for that night. Yeah. So I was How fortunate fun. in the sense of they put, I got in a car, they put me in a car, and I drove to the group for dinner. And when I got there, we all ate the meal they cooked. They prepared together. They learned to make the pasta. Mm. They learned to make the sauce. Mm. And they cooked. Yeah. Everybody at that meal was so proud that they had cooked that meal in that setting with yes. those teachers. Memorable. Right. And it was, it, I was there to eat. It was delicious. But I was envious by the time we were eating because all they wanted to talk about was how they made how it. How they made it. Right. That they were so proud of that. It's so I love true. that feeling. Mike, why don't you and I take a group to Italy? I can speak Italian, so I can I can help oh. there. We can find the best teachers. We make a you pasta. We make people happy. I think we should do that. Don't I'm threaten serious. me with it. Julie is over here. Julie, Julie is in. She's the producer of the show. Julie She's in. says yes. Her okay. hand is yeah. up high. Yeah done we should and you no, know we should do this we should because it because there's no better time than planning it now and i'll tell you why <laughs> i'll tell you why i want to go back she's coming you're going to be dis- oh she is and you're going <laughs> to be disappointed in me because when i went to italy it wasn't my choice i was i didn't set up the the tour the, okay. the time there we went to pompeii yep. which was fun yep. i mean i like pompeii did you go to the amalfi coso too that's why you're going to be disappointed in me what the, the tour, heck the du- the tour did not include so here we are oh, we can no, see no, the no, Amal- no. we can see the amalfi coast no. in the distance okay so we're going to positano yes i got buddies there that's where they i want to go restaurant right on the water it's called le tre sorelle they're wonderful guys and they will teach, they will give us cooking classes. I know they will. I just, I think that for people, I'm I, growing up the most uncultured person on the planet. And the more, I, honestly, I mean, I was, I, I joke about no, being Mike. a redneck kid growing up. I was honestly, we were a, a dirt poor and it was, I just, you know, hot dogs and beans. And, but the more I learned of, about culture, food is such a big part of it. Yeah. Our first meal in Italy was at a place that was, I'm sure for them, very touristy, but for us was an incredible experience because it was a meal and along with it, it was an opera house. Oh, wow. And they performed during the meal. Oh, my god! So with every course, there was a performance. And so we were learning the music, we were learning the food, and it was an incredible experience. We went to farms and we went to a farm for dinner. And it was, there was two bus loads. So it was 90 people or close to 90 people. Wow. And they had a, like a dining hall set up, but it was all the homemade wine from their winery. 
and their food and the ability for us to buy wine. You bought the wine as mm-hmm. much to remember the experience, as much as how delicious it was. Right. It was th- those experiences I would hope everybody could share. I, I liked Paris. I loved Italy. I loved Italy. I agree. You know what I love about you so much, Mike, is that everything you do, everything you talk about, you're so real. You're the real guy. You're the real deal. You talk about food. I can taste the pasta. You talk about politics. I understand that you've done your homework. You understand what these guys are saying on both sides. I love that. And I think food for you is going to be... A journey that's mm. never going to end. I, I, not, I love that about it. It's like anything else. When you are, um, I would imagine for me, I love music like you know, like Eddie Van Halen, the late Eddie Van Halen. I imagine his journey with playing the guitar never ended until his life ended. Exactly. It's, you're never done. Right. You're never. You're never done. Exactly. And for you too. So, what do you learn? Like you're talking about salt now. Right. Is are those the refinements for you now in your craft? Um, Yes, because we're cooking. I teach everything now from Italian, Asian, Thai, French, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean. We do knife skills. We do sausage making, all of these things. And what I'm trying to find is foolproof recipes and foolproof techniques where, you know, we tell people, somebody said, well, I made I made this chocolate chip cookie recipe and I loved it and I made it again and it didn't turn out. Okay, why? Let's stop and figure out why. The reason why is because you always want to use the same salt that you used in the first batch because salt has different water content. It has different salt content. You know, it's just different. So if you're going to make something you love, try to duplicate the same oil, the same sweet yellow onion, all of that, you know. Somebody gave me as a gift... um a salt block to cook on. Yeah, and I have I've been terrified to try it, <laughs> only because I don't I, I don't know if I'm going to get it right. But I've also heard that cooking on that salt block is an amazing, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Try it, and then you just I mean I have one actually on my dining room table, and I've got plants on it because it's just so cool. Looking. Yeah, it is very cool. Really cool. It looks like it. like a piece of stone. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, but no, I I I think that just um, getting better and learn. The thing is that what I I was so fearful because I thought, well, gosh, I know a lot about Italian cooking and American cuisine, but I don't know much about French or Thai. You realize that a recipe re- ingredients are ingredients, and it just depends on whether they're good ingredients. They may be a hot chili for Thai. It may be pepperoncini for Italian. It's all the same. And the other thing is, you can learn to cook from a recipe, but you have so many judgment calls as you're finding out mm-hmm. in the kitchen. Okay, well, the recipe tells me butter. Okay, I know brown butter is going to give it more flavor, so can I make it a brown butter and not a solid butter? So those are the things that I'm interested in is, is enhancing the flavors and refining the process a little bit. I didn't think I would be able to tell the difference. You know oh. what I mean? That I like. I, That's a I knew great I wasn't a step forward. Right, though, that you can. Yeah, is that I didn't. You know, when I go to a restaurant, I love the meal, but I can't dissect in my mind what's in it. I don't have that kind of a palate. The more you cook, the more you will. Well, that's the thing. I thought, well, if I make a recipe and I change something, am I going to tell whether or not it makes it better? But when you do mm. and you can taste the difference, as silly as it sounds, it's like that's a that's an accomplishment for me. I will tell you some things never. If, if you buy these, I will come and smack you in okay. the head. And mama will be right behind me doing the same. Never, ever, ever, ever buy garlic in a jar okay and the reason why is who knows what that is it's first of all it's brown Mm -hmm. it's rancid it's been probably on the shelf for decades so the diced garlic that comes in a jar yes it will ruin your dish and now there are restaurants that will put it on their pizza and you can taste it immediately it's just it's it's really um Pungent. There's something off-putting about it. Look, at you got fresh garlic in the store 24/7. It keeps in your, uh, in, you know, on your counter for ages. Use that. Don't. Eat, so use a good olive oil. You know, use a few ingredients, but make them good. So where? This is such a. I don't know if these tips matter, but they matter to me. <laughs> so bear with me for a That's minute. That's what counts. Where do I go to get really good fresh 
herbs. Because when I go to the grocery store, they have a vegetable section, but you don't see fresh rosemary and fresh thyme and and the and the fresh herbs and and that you right. would need to cook with. Right. So I end up buying those packaged right. ones just to get them in the recipe. Right. Where do you go? Well, you. I mean, that's where you go. Unfortunately, um, you here in Arizona, Mike. Rosemary grows like a weed. Basil grows like a weed. Italian parsley grows like a weed. Uh, so you can have a little herb garden and and grow those all day long. They're amazing. They're I strong. Try they're that. hardy. Rosemary, basil, and uh, parsley for sure. Because you can usually at the grocery store find parsley. You can find cilantro. Right. But some of the others, it's either out. And when you do find it, it's not fresh right. in a bunch. Go to Home Depot and grab a little rosemary plant. Pop that in the ground and pluck what you need. I made a, a, a white bean and Italian sausage soup, and it mm. called for fresh baby spinach. Mm-hmm. And I remember buying a bunch of spinach, and I thought, this is going to be terrible at the end. Of, at, oh, no. And I put it in at the end, and I'm like, okay, I guess I, I got to trust the process. Yeah. Because it actually was very good. And then one of the things you can do is you can take that baby spinach, get a skillet, put a little bit of maybe a shallot or a little piece of onion, a little good olive oil or butter, saute that up, shrink down that um, the spinach, and then continue the process and you're getting... Fla- I'm all about flavor bombs. Me too. Flavor bombs all day long. Leeks are a flavor bomb. Mushrooms are a flavor bomb. It's funny. The le- leeks are in the soup. <sighs> leeks are my favorite flavor bomb on the planet, you, I put them in my soup. I put them in my sauces. I put them in my stew. They impart such a, a rich sweetness to it. Again, going back to the sugar in the pasta yeah. sauce. You don't need to do that. You've got vegetables that will give you the sweetness. And that's that's the fun for me of learning what I'm doing. Yeah. And so the older I get, the more I want to spend time learning things that I love. I like my job. I love my job. But right. th- there's nothing but joy. In, in the kitchen. I know. It's amazing. You know, there should be a show on the Food Network because all of the shows are in the kitchen, but the real decisions are in the store. So they should have a show that goes around the store and says, okay, this olive or the Calavetrano olive, do I do the, do the, you know, why am I using organic tomato paste when the regular tomato paste is $1.50 less? You use it because it's going to taste better, right? And so to have somebody guide us on, you know, we pa- bypass rutabagas and parsnips and leeks all the time because we don't know what to do with them. Right. They're amazing in certain foods, you know, amazing. But I don't think we have enough knowledge. And certainly not to knock any grocery store produce managers. They know as li- they know very little anymore, it seems like. You know, there used to be the produce expert. Because there was, there was a place that opened in town, but it was only open for a minute. And they had all of the fresh vegetables and herbs you could ever want. Where was that? I can't remember the name of it now, but it was only open for a very short time. Oh, that's too But bad. it was going to cater to the chefs and to the people that love food. Hmm. But I just, I think for what it was going to cost them in that space, they ended up going under fairly quickly. But it was, that was the place you would go to where you could get all of the fresh vegetables and herbs that you wow. wanted. But it didn't last because the clientele couldn't keep up the... Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. That's a shame. You know, Mike, one of the things that I love to teach in class are tips that really save people p- money and time. We make, um, you know, if you ever bake, which is a whole different, you know, know, cooking is versus the science of baking is another matter entirely. But um, if you bake, a lot of recipes call for one cup of buttermilk, right? So you buy a quart. You can't buy a cup of buttermilk. You have to right. buy a quart. And then what do you do with the three cups? You throw it away. So we teach people how to make their own homemade buttermilk, their own homemade sour cream, their own maple syrup, because then you have it anytime you want it. You just right. make it. You make a cup, you know, a little bit of um, vinegar or lemon juice in your milk, and you've got buttermilk, you know. So I love sharing those kinds of tips. So we're going to do the Italy trip. We're going to do the Italy trip. We are going to do Julie, right? Julia. Julia, Julia, Julia. So her name got the perfect name to go to Italy. <laughs> we're going to get because we're going to do that. Uh, the exposure to culture for me. <laughs> Did you let's just before we close this out, I want to ask you this because of your familiarity with Italy. 
my breath was taken away a couple of different places in Italy, multiple places. Um, uh, there is a town up about 900 feet um, above uh, the ground on a plateau. Is it San Gimignano? No. Or Vieto. <gasps> Are you joking with me now? Are you? Jo- do you I've, know that I've spent many, a lot no. of time there? Are you kidding? Oh, I swear to you. If you go... I cried. I, I, I took the funicular train up. We got on the bus. We went into the middle of the city in the square, right by the Duomo, which is all mosaic on the outside, no paint. And before I went into the church, I was crying. I know. Okay. Orvieto is this Etruscan ancient fortress on a hill that's surrounded by the most beautiful stone fortress. You step off the tra- the funiculare, the tram, and the gondola, and you end up in this the front in the front of this most massive cathedral that you've ever seen in your life. And if you go up the street to a little Italian restaurant called the Etruscan, if you ask them for their wine cellar, they'll take you down to the bottom of the cellar, and my picture is there. <laughs> now we, I, I believe that's where we ate lunch at the Etruscan. Yes. Oh my gosh. So had I known, I've cooked that, with them a lot. Okay. A lot. But the beauty in that, the, the, oh first God. of all, you're standing there and you're stunned that anybody could accomplish building that building up there. But to think of when they built it. Yeah. yeah. But for me, then we went to Florence Mm -hmm. and I remember waiting in line to get in to the museum and I wanted to see David. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to see it. (laughs) And there was this long hallway. And then off in the distance was the room where David is, the statue. And we were all so tunnel visioned at getting there. You, we didn't see anything around us. And the stunning, tour guy said, you got to see the rest of this. Yeah. By the time we got into the room, we were crying. I know. It's, I, I, it's, it's hard to explain emotion connected to that kind of beauty. And then you get the people that try to destroy it. And, you know, like the Mona Lisa, the two gals that threw so- soup. soup on it. Um, and, and, you know, the attacks on the David for so many years and the mother in the, you know, well, the, the statue, mother Mary and the statue in St. Peter's Basilica of, mm. uh, is it La Pieta? Am La, I pronoun- Piet, yeah. La Pieta. Yeah. And that means the pity. Right. The Piet, with the mother. And it's got, it's got the Virgin Mary holding Jesus and one of her hands is pointed. They actually damaged that years ago. Oh, they yeah. had to block it off where you can't get close. I was there. When it happened? Uh, yes, I was 18 years old. No. Yeah, and we went, and it was all, we couldn't see it. I was with my mom. It was my first trip there with her. And to walk into St. Peter's Basilica and realize there's 11 altars in there. Now, I was raised Catholic, but I'm I don't, not a practicing Catholic. So it wasn't the significance of my faith. Just, Just the beauty. The beauty of it. And, and how two hands, two hands from one man, you know, multiplied can create something like that. And then when you find out he was 23 when he did it, to walk into the Sistine Chapel, which, by the way, much smaller than I imagined. Everything is, the Mona Lisa is like a postage stamp. (laughs) You're expecting this huge thing, you know, it's like a little thing behind glass. But when you walk into, when you walk into the the chapel, I expected it to be a bigger room. But you can't, you don't know where to focus your eyes. I know. From the ceiling to the mural on the back wall. But the, the culture and the attention to detail and the pride that people have in their history and to be in downtown Rome. And I explain to people, if you drive down Third Street in Phoenix, you run into the footprint center in the middle of town. Right. In Rome, you turn a corner and the Colosseum <laughs> yes. is in the middle of downtown. <laughs> right over the freeway. It is. <laughs> it, it, you're in this modern city and then you walk back in time. It's, it's amazing. To walk, you're in the middle it's of amazing. downtown Rome. They're looking for a place to park the bus. And you get off the bus, you walk half a block mm-hmm. and you're in the forum. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's incredible. A, it is. It's amazing. Well, Julia is still in the room, so we are going. Okay. And we're taking her with we us. We are. Or she's taking taking us with her one or the other we're going to figure this out it will out. be one or the other but I, I just wanted to say thank you um Absolutely. we've known each other for 20 years you have been one of the people that i've admired the most because when i was new in the media business because i didn't ever intend to do this for a living what i didn't how could you you're perfect mm. you're perfect at it i had no i had no knowledge or intention that this is the direction my life would go right and i met very very blessed i met a few people along the way and you were the first that was an example 
of at the time you had the the media career was going on you were uh, uh, the radio show was going strong <laughs> and you were so loved in the industry and I thought how you connected with people and I thought the only way I'm ever going to survive in this business is if I can connect with people you were someone I admired from such a long time ago and for all these years later for us to still be friends and to see your success and oh. everybody loves you as much as I do you, I think it's amazing oh my god thank you so much you know kindness and humility uh, if I can have those two things if I can be a kind person and have humility then I'm good and you you and from the perspective I've never seen you not have both thank you and uh, we and we've been in some <laughs> political rooms together you know and we've done oh my some God. of those things that together. night that night I was crying my eyes out. I re- we were remember we were supposed oh. do you remember that night yeah okay. we were at the Biltmore Every we were supposed to host the VIP party together. Mm-hmm. And then... And we were the only two in the room. The only two in the room. <laughs> the, the, this was, for anybody, this was the night that President <laughs> Obama beat John McCain on election <laughs> night. And they came to us, and I think at the time both of us were relieved that they canceled the party. Oh my gosh, yes. Because we didn't know how we were going to host a party, at least I didn't, when the news had been so bad. I've never in my life worn false eyelashes, and I had I wore false eyelashes, <laughs> eyelashes that night because I wanted to be just be wow. And boy, the tears just peeled those things off one by one. I threw them out and went home and went, okay, now what? But that's the thing in that world that can be so contentious, and it's gotten even worse over the years. But to be mm-hmm. in that world and not be affected and not have it affect you and jade you, yeah. that was an accomplishment for you. For you, too. Well... These are the examples that at some point you have to be an observer. Right. And exactly. um, mm-hmm. I love it. I absolutely love it. But I don't want to get so invested in something anymore where I'm angry. And I, I, I can feel the anger. Yes. I can see the anger. I don't want to be angry. Boy, and that's so healthy. It's just healthy. You know, you take care of yourself. You work out. You you do thing, mindful things that help you grow. Yeah. The anger, I believe that and for a lot of people, they get cancer and they get disease because there's anger and they don't know how to get it out. And it's anger gone inward that creates, I think, that creates, stress. Yes. And that can create all kinds of problems. So let it go. You've got to let it go. Well, I am so glad that you're happy and successful and it's great to see you. So happy. And the next time they hear from us, it's going to be when they can sign up for our trip to Italy. <laughs> Amen. And it's going to go fast, so sign up and now. And what will be the best time of year to go to Italy? What's the best time of year to go? You know, you could either go May, June, July, or you can go... Now, August, we don't want to go because it's Ferragosto and everybody's on vacation. Unless we all want to go on vacation to Positano or Capri or to Sorrento. But in August... Everything shuts down and the whole country is on vacation. But I would say June is perfect or September. Okay. June or September. Is Julia listening? She's listening. Okay. Just oh, she's, June she's or taking September. notes. So <laughs> her and I, I'm sure, are going to be having a conversation in the morning. You know what? Why We can do it. Why not? It's a no-brainer. And people, their lives will be changed for pasta. And the, and the, the, my fear is because I, I don't speak Italian is the communication part of it. So that so you got is, me. I was I was uh, one last story. I was in. <laughs> we took a tour group the first week of June. Now my birthday is June fourth, and the first week of June we went to France, mm-hmm. an eleven day trip. But the reason, we, the significance of going that at that time was for the anniversary of D Day. So we were in Normandy. I remember that, yeah. We were in Normandy. Uh, we got to go to uh, Belgium and Luxembourg for the anniversary. But while we were in Paris, I've never seen people drive like they drive in that city. <laughs> and we're on these huge buses. No rules. Well, here's what's funny. Our t- the guy on the tour, great guy, lives here in the Valley, and he's been doing tours since he was in college, and I think he's in his 60s now. So he really knows. He speaks French. He lives in France part of the year. Yeah. But he doesn't speak Italian. Well, we're in Paris, and our bus drivers are his bus drivers from Italy on his tours in Italy. They don't speak English. <laughs> He doesn't speak Italian. So he's doing what every American does is if you speak slower and louder in English, (laughs) they'll understand. (laughs) So I was with a girl that speaks seven languages. So we had to sit in the front of the bus because she speaks Italian. 
So he would speak to her in English. He would speak to them in Italian to get us to where we needed to go oh my God. in this maniac. And it's not a maniac city, but the drivers, yeah. they drive these little scooters. And they know exactly what they're they doing. And they zip around like flies. Yeah. And they're in this close to buses it's doing crazy. 45 miles an hour. It's insane. It is. And if you are in this lane and you need to turn left, nobody gets angry. You just turn left. That's right. And if you're on the autostrada in Italy, if you're not going 400 miles an hour, they're going to they're gonna honk that horn until you pull over. It's crazy. It's real scary. <laughs> well, but it, but for me, the, the barrier was the language. Yeah. Because in a lot of places, they do speak English. But I want to communicate with people. Right. And I'm not afraid to try, but I don't know how to speak. Mike, all you need to learn is this. Andiamo mangiare. Do you know what that means? Mm -mm. Andiamo mangiare. Let's go eat. Right. But then how do I order the food? Point at the picture? Let's see. You can say... I can't just eat no, spaghetti forever. No, no, no. You're going to say specialità della casa. Okay. Special, how special? How specialty? Dammi la specialità della casa. And so here's what I did in Rome. I'm keep, well, now I'm telling you all these dumb stories. <laughs> We stayed at this beautiful hotel in Rome for four days, and right up the street from the hotel was something called the American Cafe. I know where that is. Okay. Yes, in Rome. Right. Yes. So I thought, oh my gosh. I know where that Authentic is. Authentic Italian food. <laughs> so I'm sitting in this American Cafe, and I'm eating a bowl of pasta with a Chianti, yeah. listening to Metallica <laughs> and watching. They love rock right? music there. And I'm oh. watching American sports <laughs> on the TVs. That's hilarious. And I, but I was like, I'm cheating. I'm at a sports bar. <laughs> I'm at an American sports bar <laughs> eating, in Italy. But it was my it was my cheat. It was like, okay, yeah. now I can, I know I can get along here. Yeah. Food was amazing. Oh, no, that's not going to be a problem. That's okay. not going to be a problem at all. All right. Promise. Mm. Promise. Okay. Promesso. So if people want to find you, find your website, social media, whatever, yes. because I want them to learn more about you. And if they want oh, your cooking wonderful. classes, how can they sign up? Okay. So I'm up at Sweet Basil Culinary Center. We just moved. We've been in the Valley 30 years, but we just moved um, the last two years. We're up at Pinnacle Peak in Pima in the La Mirada Shopping mm -hmm. Center. It's next to Jade Palace and Mastro's. Beautiful school. It's a retail store that has everything. Everything you could possibly want to cook, knives and gadgets and pots and pans and coffee makers, you name it. And then we have a cooking school. We do 40 classes a, a month. So every day and Friday nights are gourmet couples. Friday day is lunch and learn where the instructor teaches you and you just enjoy a meal. Everything else is hands on. Any cuisine you want, any level. It's there. And, and what's the website for Sweet Basil? SweetBasilGourmet.com. Okay. And the classes fill up so fast. So if they, you see something you like, grab it. And what about you personally? What, what? So I'm always there. <laughs> no, your, your website, so how my, can people find you? So Jandiatri.com. Uh, J-A-N-D-A-T-R-I dot com. And I'm not doing the one minute videos anymore because it would take me 18 hours of writing, cooking, prepping, um, styling, shooting, editing, writing, and then <laughs> recording to do one minute. Right. And I thought, I don't have 18 hours right now to do one minute, but I have tons of recipes and tons of videos on there right now. Okay, perfect. Yeah, sweet basil cornado. This has cornado. been so much fun. I love it. I'm going to go home what? now and throw out my jar of garlic. Go home and pack. <laughs> throw, out my, <laughs> throw out my jar of garlic in the refrigerator. Uh-huh, yeah. I saw that look on your face when I mentioned it. I don't use it. I use the fresh garlic, <laughs> no, but I have it. an old one toss in the it. fridge. Toss it's it. gone. It's, it's gone. gone. Because I, like you, I use the, I use the fresh garlic and... But you're right. I never knew that there that was a cardinal sin. It's a cardinal sin in my book. Okay. So, well, it's gone. It's gone today. I'm going to throw it away. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for I doing this. I love you to pieces. This is why I love her. <laughs>